we're going to start a new question today, a question about the accidents that remain in the Blessed Sacrament after consecration. So last couple of times we've been talking a bit complexly about the mode in which Jesus is present under the blessed, in the Blessed Sacrament, kind of under the disguise of bread. And um, today we're going to shift topics slightly to now ask about how do those properties of bread and properties of wine uh, exist or remain in the sacrament, in the Blessed Sacrament, in the Eucharist. This is the 14th episode, and we begin now. Okay, there's no cool... Well, actually, I guess there was a cool intro beforehand. Now it's just me talking. So the way that the Eucharist works, so to speak, is by a conversion of the substance of bread into the conversion of the substance of Christ's body without the accidents, without the appearance of the thing um, changing at all, right? There's no change to the appearance or to the properties of bread or to the appearance or to the properties of wine in um, the conversion that takes place at Mass and transubstantiation. That leaves us with the question of wondering how do those properties of bread or how do those properties of wine exist? Like what's the way in which they exist? Because in every other circumstance, the properties of some particular existing thing, they exist like within, kind of resting in, so to speak, um, the, the, that subject, that substance. So like the blackness of this sweater, for example, um, that exists in, so to speak, the sweater itself, right? You don't have like this blackness sort of just like floating around. It's like, no, it, it only exists in the sweater. And then if this sweater, goes away, then so too does that property of its color or the property of its um, material, like the fabric that's made out of. Okay, so what's miraculous about the Eucharist is that the accidents, the properties, the expressions of bread, those are suspended in existence. That's a kind of phrase that's become somewhat popular in describing it. Right? They, they don't exist within a proper subject. They don't exist within uh, a substance. Right? And this is important to say because someone could, could wonder like, well, why don't, the sub, why don't the accidents of bread exist in the substance or in the subject of Jesus? And the reason for that is because that would affect the, the substance of Jesus. Anytime there's a property added to some particular substance, to some particular existing thing, that changes that thing in a certain way, right? So if I gain 10 pounds, then I have changed me by adding something. In fact, by adding 10 things, 10 units of weight <laughs> because of Christmas. Okay, that would be, hmm, is that possible? Who knows? Uh, but that's the point. It changes me. So we can't. So because Jesus isn't changed by the consecration of bread into his body, we can't say that the accidents of bread exist or adhere in the substance. Okay. So then we can ask, well, is this possible for God to do? And I think this is an important point. Every time you and I ask whether or not something is possible for God to do, implied or implicit within that question is um, the assumption that this is something that's not logically contradictory, okay? So when we talk about possible things for God to do, when we talk about what is, all, even though he's all powerful, like we have to, by necessity, bracket off those things that are logically contradictory. The reason for that is because logically contradictory things don't have any existence. That's a basic tenet of reality, right? So you don't have, not even conceptually, a square circle. It gets a contradiction. It doesn't exist. So God can't make uh, a square circle, not because that's a limitation on God's power, but because what you're proposing has no existence. It's unintelligible. There's nothing to it. Okay, so 
the kind of payoff of this, practically speaking, is that whenever we ask about whether or not something is possible for God, um, we're asking implicitly whether or not that thing has a kind of logical impossibility associated to it. And if it's not logically contradictory, that means it's not uh, impossible for God, right? Because it has some kind of reality that then could be brought into existence and could be intelligible in a certain respect. Okay, so we can ask that question now. Like, is it is it a, a contradiction for God to suspend the properties of some existing thing without those properties existing in that thing, right? Like, can you have the accidents of bread and wine just f floating, so to speak? Okay, the answer that Aquinas gives to this is yes, and it's and then he says this is why God can do it. Um, God can do it because He's the first cause. He's the the thing that creates and holds um, everything in existence. Everything that exists, God holds in existence. Everything that exists, you could say, like participates or shares in some way in God's existence because that's who He is. He is existence itself, and so everything else that exists shares, so to speak, in that reality, in, in fact, reality itself, who is God. This is true both of substances, of things that have a kind of st stable existence in themselves, like, you know, my sweater, nice sweater, man, and also accidents, things that are properties that exist within those substance, substances. Okay. So that's how. So God sustains both of those things in existence. And even though the ordinary course of existing things is to have properties exist within substances, um, God's capable by his, by his uh, divine power to sustain accidents in existence. Like it doesn't entail a logical contradiction. So like another example of this um, with respect to bringing about a substance in a supernatural way, in a way that's outside of the bounds of nature, would be the virgin birth of Jesus. Like he was born outside of the normal course of human generation. Uh, and that doesn't imply a logical contradiction because God can produce the natural effects of some action in a supernatural way. Like one way of thinking about this, I guess, could be that God who created the laws of nature um, isn't bound always to follow those laws of nature, right? This is why we pray to him for miracles, which kind of rightly defined are the um, the supervention, is that a word, going around the laws of nature. The next question that Aquinas addresses is, well, what is the kind of thing in which these accidents adhere like they have to exist in some kind of respect in something right so um, because they exist so like what what would that thing be and Aquinas says it's the quantity of bread so like how like the mass maybe could be a, a way of putting it it's a it's the mass it's like how much is there you know it's like okay it's one gram and it, it takes up this much space within like physically it takes up this much space. It's, it's inches, one diameter. Okay, okay. That's the kind of demensive quality. That's the foundational um, property in which the other properties also have a kind of existence. Um, but it's worth noting that generally speaking, that property of the demensive quality, quantity, the, uh, the kind of how muchness there is of this thing, uh, exists in the substance and the substance isn't there as we've been mentioning. So anyways, this one I don't think is that actually particularly important. Nor is this next one which says whether the species remaining in this sacrament can change external objects. I think that's pretty straightforward. It's like can the accidents of bread that are present in the Blessed Sacrament or the accidents of wine, can those have any effect on physical things outside of them? And the answer is of course yes because they have their own their own kind of existence there. It's just not a substantial existence. Okay, then this next question is interesting and it'll be our concluding point. It's whether or not the sacramental species, so when we're talking about sacramental species, we're talking about the accidents of bread and the accidents of wine, right? So whether or not these can be corrupted and by corrupted, he means a technical term, not a kind of like moral corruption. He means a movement from existing to non-existing, from being to non-being, right? So decay is probably a more 
Decay is probably just a better word. Okay. Um, so can these things decay from being, you know, the accidents of bread to not the accidents of bread? The answer is like, of course, yes. Um, and in fact, this is how I had a friend of mine who came into the church maybe a decade ago, and she was receiving First Holy Communion for the first time in college and was really excited about it, um, naturally so. But she had a pretty practical, basic question of like, well, what happens after I receive our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament and he's inside of me, like, and I'm, in, I'm ingesting the Blessed Sacrament and it's going down my throat into my body, into my stomach, and like, what happens then? You know, it's like, oh, that's a great question. Jesus is present under the mode, under the disguise of bread and under the disguise of wine. So once those expressions, once those properties that help us to, that allow us to identify this thing, you know, as bread or this thing as wine, once those are no longer present, nor is Jesus substantially present in the Blessed Sacrament, right? So after our natural digestive system and process has uh, has done its thing to such an extent that you know you can't really identify this in an ordinary human way as bread or as wine, then Jesus is no longer present. That's kind of this principle how how this works. It's it's worth mentioning that not every single alteration of the species of the sacred species changes it uh, into something that's not suitable to res to maintain the presence of Jesus. So for example, like if somebody dripped water onto a host, it's like, well, that's like, that's still identifiable as bread. And so it's not like this has changed the substance. Uh, it's not like this has changed the, the, the accidents of bread so much that like this is unrecognizable now as bread. It's like, no, that's still, you know, that still has the properties of bread and therefore still communicates or holds, it's probably a better word, holds within it or is, is maybe even a better word, um, the, uh, the sacramental presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. Okay, see you guys later.